Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Please rise as you are able, in body or spirit, and listen now for the word of God. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all of the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Church, it is a gift to always be with you all, but it's a gift to be with you all on this particular morning as we celebrate a baptism, as we prepare into the summer, as we have this belief that summer will bring us an opportunity to breathe and slow down when we know things will just pick right back up in a different way. But it is a gift to be with you all because in the moments of life that we share together, we celebrate the richness of these sacraments, of these rituals that we share together. And as I was preparing for our time together, as I was preparing for what, what is a word that might be of some benefit to you or maybe just me, I continue to sit on the fact that it has been a hard year. It's been a hard couple of years. And depending on who you ask, it's been a hard couple of decades. And then if you really look in the totality of our history, we have seen that time and time again throughout human history that we, we have ached, we have longed for something better, we have longed for healing, we have longed for justice, we have longed for hope, and we believe that in this moment of time that this is the worst it will ever be and it can only get worse. And here's this good news. That time and time again, God has been with us. That time and time again, God has sustained us, God has carried us, and God has been with us. And we see that throughout Scripture that this is a theme throughout this entire text. That even as we are in the wilderness, we are not alone. And so I had this opportunity this past Thursday to go out to First United Methodist Church of Salina and and talk with their men's group about, um, like, manhood, masculinity, and mental health. And we had this really rich conversation about some of the, the barriers that men experience when it comes to navigating their own mental health or therapy in general. And the data shows that some of these biggest issues, which coincide with these issues that we experience as a society is that the lonely, <clears throat> excuse me, the lonelier we are, the more isolated we are, the harder it becomes to believe that life has something for us. And, that, and as we were sitting in this group talking together, it was, we were sharing the complexities of life and sharing the things that feel burdensome to us to go and seek out connection, to seek out hope, to seek out assistance and care and attention through mental health or just community. There was this recognition that there are so many external factors that play into this. So many understandings of scripts that people have taken and have said, this is how you show up. And if you can't show up this way, then you don't need to take up space. This is how you act. And if you can't act in this way, then you don't need to take up space. And the reality is we are all so complex and different. We all have needs emotionally. We all have needs spiritually. We all have needs socially, relationally. And as we were talking through 
the, the struggles of navigating life together. So we were talking through what it looks like for, for us to be able to go and step, take a step forward and to get the care and attention that we need. We kind of distilled it to this one simple reality. That sometimes life is just really hard. And sometimes we feel like we're barely making it. And we're white knuckling. We're living day to day, hoping that we can make it till tomorrow. And all we have is a hope and a prayer. And so I'm grateful for mornings like today. I'm grateful for a morning in which we get to celebrate baptism together, in which we get to see the commitment of a family engage into the life of our church and the ways that they have been faithfully a part of our church for years and years. The way we usher in a younger generation into that work, our commitment and caring for that, because in the midst of life that is really hard, in the midst of the things that hold us back, in the midst of everything that we have, we know that God is with us. And yet, that feeling can feel so fleeting. And yet, we know that we have worked so hard for the life that we have created for ourselves. We know we have worked so hard to get to this place, that our families have worked so hard, that our, that our community has worked so hard. And yet, we find ourselves in these situations in which our health takes a turn that no one expected. Where we find ourselves unfulfilled in the work that we have worked our entire life for. And now we don't know what to do or what we should do moving forward. That maybe the relationships that we had don't allow us to be fully seen and connected in the ways that we had hoped and yearned for. And maybe things in our family are difficult and nebulous and dissonant at times. That maybe there are people in this room who are deeply empathetic people who deeply feel the pain and the sorrow and loss of our world, of our community, and of our congregation. That there are so many pieces here that take a shift from where we thought we were going. So many pieces here that take a shift of where we are today. That for some of us, we've retired, we did our work, we're able to be present and do the things. This is the, the golden era, as I've been told. Can't wait to get there one day. <laughs> and yet I've had a lot of conversations with people where there's a difficult transition into that stage of life. A difficult transition in understanding what we will fill our time with and what is worth our investment and what, what do we have to offer when we've separated the work that we've done for decades, when we've separated the things that we have, the roles we have filled, like what do we have? And so really, in no matter what stage of life we're in, suddenly we look up and suddenly we find ourselves standing in the wilderness. And not too dissimilar from Jesus, we're tired, we're hungry, and maybe we're a little unsure of how we're going to take a step forward. Because the truth is, the wilderness isn't only lonely, it brings out our deepest insecurities. It brings out all the things that are within us that, that cause things to feel vulnerable and stressful and a little bit anxious. And so maybe for this morning, as we sit with all those things, as we sit with these feelings, we come back to the scripture that Jaden just read for us. We come back to these 13 verses in which Jesus and the devil have this encounter throughout this time of fasting, this time of deep thirst that I imagine Jesus had, this time in which Jesus is away for 40 days. And then what we know here, I think this is an important piece for us to remember, is that as Luke is writing this story and as we're in this place, that Jesus is in the wilderness. And that those hearing, those familiar with the Old Testament, would, that would ring a bell for them. Oh, wilderness. We, we know what it means to be in the wilderness. We know what it means to walk and to wonder and not know how we might get out. We know what it means to hunger. And what we see even more eloquently is that as Jesus is having this exchange, that these responses come out of Deuteronomy verses chapters 6 through 8. That as Jesus and the devil in this story come through, that there is 
these promptings that come up. That, that the devil comes in and questions Jesus' ability to provide for himself. It says here that if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you can do it, let's see it. Make them bread. You're hungry, aren't you? And Jesus responds, one does not live by bread alone. So then there's a, there's a pivot, there's a deviation here. So then we see that in verses 5 through 8, the devil takes Jesus up, shows him all that is before him, and offers up in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. He says, to you I will give you their glory and all of this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written. Worship the Lord your God and only serve God. And then we come into this third exchange in which the devil takes Jesus up to Jerusalem, places him at the pinnacle and says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. If you are who you say you are, that shouldn't be a problem at all. God has got you, right? And verse 10 says this, for it is written, God will command God's angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that, they, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And verse 12 says this, and Jesus answered him and said, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. That as we see in this exchange, in these interactions, that Jesus is in the deepest parts of the wilderness. Jesus has been fasting. Jesus has been alone. And that prior to this moment, prior to this exchange, we see this prolific thing take place with Jesus, that Jesus is baptized, the Spirit descends upon Jesus, and then Jesus finds himself into the wilderness, wrestling with the deepest parts of himself, wrestling with the deepest parts of what the body craves and needs. And I think we, too, find ourselves in the wilderness, that we wrestle with what we feel we need, that we question and sometimes even believe that God is not present for us in this moment, that God has left us or abandoned us in the wilderness. And yet, verse 13 says, and the devil departs. The wilderness ends. Verse 13 Reads, when the devil had finished every test, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. The wilderness ends, and yet we see later on in the story that this is not the only time Jesus will walk through the wilderness. But this wilderness moment ends, and Jesus enters into his ministry. He begins his teaching, and people are amazed. And the truth is, we all find ourselves in these moments. We all find ourselves in these moments of wilderness, unsure of how we'll make it out. And Jesus' example of surviving the wilderness gives us hope. It gives us hope that the wilderness does not last forever. And that even in the wilderness, God is transforming us. That as we sit with this text, as we reflect on what Jesus experienced in the wilderness, we can't help but wonder how Jesus' time in the wilderness relates and impacts his role as Messiah. That trusting in God during this time, Jesus used scripture to sustain him. And Jesus used scripture to center him into who God has called him to be. That the wilderness shaped Jesus in a profound way. But the wilderness is also maybe a part of our path in ways in which we will experience God more fully and profoundly. Because the truth is, when we read these texts, we know that exactly what is taking place between Jesus and the devil in these moments, that, that Jesus had all the power to do the things that he was tempted about. That Jesus could have turned bread into stone. Reverse that, stone into bread. Got it. <laughs> got, got to love uh, dyslexia, it's awesome. Uh, that Jesus could have done that. And yet some way, somehow, Jesus centered himself in the scripture, centered himself in the promises of what God has, 
and what feels like even in this exchange a moment of waiting, of choosing to wait and be still in who God is even in the midst of deep, deep hardship. When we are in the thick of it, when we see that we have no way out, it's super easy for us to doubt, for us to question, and for us to believe that it is just us in this season of life. And what we see throughout Luke's gospel, that this is, this is an invitation, this is a proclamation, that this is an awareness and an orientation to say, like, listen, this, as you read these stories, that, that the salvation, new life, hope, and purpose is available right here and now. It doesn't have to wait until later, that the invitation is near. And that may be a part of that, maybe a part of how we experience delivery, maybe a part of how we come into the fullness of who we are and what we do is we sit and wrestle and grow in the midst of the wilderness. And maybe instead of running from it, maybe we sit with it, we're attentive to where we are, we have other people present with us, and we grow and we believe something is new is possible. There's this idea, as I was thinking about what this looks like practically, um, that, we, that we can take this idea of wilderness both metaphorically, for sure, and also literally. That there is this practice called wilderness therapy. Anyone familiar with what wilderness therapy is? Great. I'm so, okay, a few of us. I'm so happy we get to explore this together. And so what this looks like is if, you, if there are a group of people who are looking for an avenue, maybe talk therapy isn't fitting their needs, or there's just a disconnect as they are discerning what their social, emotional, mental needs are, that they might participate in wilderness therapy. You go outside, you go into this curated environment with trained therapists and outdoor guides, and you, par- you play a little bit. You have some fun. You go hiking, you camp, you go fishing, you Lay on a hammock, like, like really, like whatever like your camping experience looks like, like there's that environment set for you. But there's also intentional small groups time in which we work through whatever the tasks are, whatever the, the blocks are, whatever things that are weighing most heavily on those people who have registered to engage with this. And they grow from engaging in these practices. They grow from the conversations that happen within their small group. But they also grow from just being outside and taking a breath, from sitting and being in creation, from enjoying the gift of what the wilderness has, even if it looks a little different than our normal lives. That as people go and they participate in these type of retreats, that it helps them discern awareness of what is happening within themselves. It helps them be more vulnerable. It helps them develop coping strategies for when they're anxious or stressed or, or angry. It helps them create an awareness of what's happening within them and then how they choose to manifest that through their actions. It helps them see a little more clearly who they are, who God is calling them into. What... God might be ushering us forward as we reflect on how we want to show up and be available. That throughout this process, there is this development of hope. We're we're hoping to, within each person, increase their locus of control, that there's a build in confidence, that there's an improvement in the way that they connect with one another and the way they communicate what they need and the way they understand who they are and what God is calling them into. And so whether this is a literal or metaphorical place for us, the truth of the matter is, no matter what happens, when we return from the wilderness, we are different. We are forever changed. That in Luke's gospel, Jesus is baptized, Jesus enters into the wilderness, and then Jesus goes And you know the rest of the story. People's lives are changed. Miracles are done. Death is conquered. When we return from the wilderness, we are changed. 
I really love the way Barbara Brown Taylor, who's an Episcopalian priest, talks about this, talks about sitting in the wilderness. She says that you did not choose it, that the wilderness is no place you would have ever gone on your own. You're not in control. You can't even control the pounding of your own heart, whether it's noisy or quiet. There's one sound that is missing, and that is the voice of God. It might even seem like the wilderness to you isn't such a big deal if you could hear the voice telling you that everything's going to be all right, that you're not alone, that this is all for a reason, but you cannot hear that, that the silence defines the wilderness. The silence defines the wilderness. That silence that calls us into question everything we know, everything that we believe, and it is that silent in wilderness moments that we live that shape us into something new. That when we come out, we're not the same. And the truth is, when we come out, sometimes everything isn't better or fixed. That sometimes when we come out of the wilderness, we have scars upon us, and these scars are holy because they're a part of our stories. They're a part of how we understand God. They're a part of how we understand how we choose to move forward. But those scars are still present with us. Those scars will always shape how we choose to live life moving forward. That when we return from the wilderness, we are transformed in the ways that we have experienced ourselves, the ways we have experienced God, and the way that we believe God is calling us into. So we remember that in our deepest wanderings, we are not alone. That God is with us. And that those around us in this church and those who are with us online and our family and friends that are here, they are here to be with us, to encourage us, to usher us forward, and to sit with us when we find ourselves in those seasons of life. That each time when we share in a baptism, we commit to ourselves and one another and to God to share this journey of life and faith together. That even when we are in the midst of the wilderness, when we leave, we are forever changed because we're never alone. Glory to God. Amen.